I discovered what this ending means in Help Wanted 2, and we're going to talk about that and more in today's video. All right, so I'm a little late to making my Help Wanted 2 theory video, considering the game came out last year, but the game did have a lot to uncover. The game had new characters, the game had returning characters, the game had more collectibles in it than there are dead kids in the franchise, and to top it all off, there are two endings that we're still trying to decipher the meaning of. With all this in mind, I really didn't know where I wanted to start this video. So if we're going to start anywhere, let's start at the end. So, the bad ending of the game takes place when you collect all six Faz Force action figures. Freddy, Bonnie, Chica, Foxy, Golden Freddy, and the Puppet. Afterwards, you combine them all into one action figure. After collecting the last action figure, we're teleported to a charging station where we see Glitchtrap's hand emerging. We're then surrounded by staff bots and our vision cuts to static. Afterwards, we see a staff bot booting screen. When we finally finish booting up, we find out that we're actually the ones handing Cassie the Vanny mask at the beginning of Ruin. So what does it all mean? Well, many other theorists have already determined that we're playing as Cassie's father in this game, more on him later, and that he's being forced to watch as his own daughter makes the same mistake that he does by putting on the Vanny mask. Now this part I agree with. I do think that we are playing as Cassie's father. The part that I don't agree with is what they're saying about Glitchtrap. What I've seen others say is that after Glitchtrap emerges from the charging station, he sicks the staff bots on us to kill us. But that doesn't follow what we know about William. William's not afraid to get his hands dirty. He's the one who kills all the kids in the Freddy's franchise. He's also the one who manages to disassemble all the animatronics in the Follow Me minigame. So why all of a sudden is he sending staff bots to kill us? And yes, I do know that Glitchtrap isn't William, but it is the Mimic that is trying to emulate William, so it should try and do the same thing that William would do. Now here's the thing, I think Glitchtrap does do what William would do. I think Glitchtrap does kill us, and the staff bots are there to save us. Now these staff bot designs have always interested me. I mean, they've got a staff bot for every occasion. They've got mop bots, they've got chef bots, they've got comedy bots, but these staff bots are designed to look like Nightmare Yone the Nightmare Puppet. Now while Nightmare Yone isn't the puppet, I do believe that it is a corrupted version of the puppet, meaning that it would have the same basic instincts as the original puppet. Now the puppet has one very specific role from way back in FNAF 2, and that was to give gifts and give life to the kids. So I think that even after all these years and the puppet being corrupted into this weird nightmare version of itself, it still managed to have its instincts kick in and save Cassie's father. Now I am using the word save here a little loosely considering that the puppet makes the same mistake that it did back in the 80s by trapping Cassie's father's soul in an animatronic. But speaking of Cassie's dad, let's talk about who he really is. Now we don't get a lot of information about Cassie's dad, but what we do get is really vital and paints us a really good picture. Cassie's dad is a FNAF technician, collects vintage FNAF things from the 80s, and his favorite animatronic is Bonnie. Now because every other theorist has went over most of what I want to say, we're going to speed run through the parts that you probably already heard. Because Cassie's dad's favorite animatronic is Bonnie, and Help Wanted 2's achievement Remember Jeremy has a Bonnie mask, we can assume that Cassie's dad's name is Jeremy. We can also assume from Jeremy's favorite animatronic and the masks we collect in Rune being in the same location as Mike and Bonnie Bro in FNAF 4 that Jeremy is Bonnie Bro. The next connection we have for Jeremy is the Jeremy from Help Wanted 1 who cuts off his own face. They're both named Jeremy and they're both Fazbear technicians. That's about the whole connection. The last connection I've heard for Jeremy is the Jeremy from FNAF 2. Again, they're both named Jeremy, and the Jeremy from FNAF 2 was tampering with the animatronics, which would help him get the job later whenever he becomes a Fazbear technician. Now I have one more possible connection for Jeremy. The only problem is, I don't know how it adds to Jeremy's story yet. From the stuff that we just went over, we know that Jeremy is friends with Michael, he likes the FNAF brand, and he likes collecting FNAF memorabilia. That describes somebody else that we know from the franchise. I think Jeremy is... Oh, I'm getting a phone call. Hello? Hey, hey, glad you came back for another night. That's right. I think Jeremy is the FNAF 3 phone dude. It always felt weird to me that even though this is our first night at Fazbear Frights, Michael is getting welcomed back by phone dude and in such a casual way. 
But if Michael and Phone Dude are friends, like Michael and Jeremy would be, it would make more sense as to why Phone Dude is speaking to Michael so casually and why Michael is helping even before the establishment is open. Like the attraction opens in like a week. So we have to make sure everything works and nothing catches on fire. We also get to see how much of an avid collector phone dude is, not just from his collection in Fazbear Frights, but also being able to identify that the Foxy mask might be a fake. Uh, now let me tell you about what's new. We found another set of drawings, always nice, and a Foxy head, which we think could be authentic. Then again, it might just be another crappy cosplay. Lastly, Phone Dude says something very peculiar on night two about the training tapes. He says, First of all, we found some vintage audio training cassettes. Dude, these are like prehistoric. I think they were like training tapes for like other employees or something like that. Which is interesting because he uses the word other employees, perhaps implying that he used to be one. Now, I know I said there wasn't a huge connection between Jeremy from Help Wanted 2 and Jeremy from FNAF 2, but if what Phone Dude implies is true and the FNAF 2 location in 1987 was the last open Freddy's location, that could mean that Phone Dude worked at that location and could imply that Jeremy from FNAF 2 is Jeremy from Help Wanted 2. But again, I don't know how this adds to Jeremy's story just yet. The only thing that I can come up with is that it gives William more incentive to go after Jeremy. On top of Jeremy already killing his son, now he's destroying the Freddy's name using Fazbear Frights. But how do you think this adds to Jeremy's character? Leave a comment down below on what you think, and while you're down there, don't forget to like the video and subscribe for more of my content in the future. But now with Jeremy out of the way, let's talk about something else I found interesting in Help Wanted 2. Steel Wool really likes using these new animatronics in Help Wanted 2 to tease this carnival game that they've been talking about. I mean, Mystic Hippo is a fortune teller, and Carney's a Carney. But I think these two newer animatronics are the key to the early part of the timeline. This theory I actually drafted up on Twitter, so go follow me on there if you want to see what I'm thinking about both FNAF and non-FNAF related. You see, I think we could safely say that both of these animatronics were designed by Henry due to their design similarities from other animatronics that we've already seen. Carney is obviously just a redesign of Rockstar Freddy or Lefty, and Mystic Hippo is just a different version of Mr. Hippo. Now what got me interested in both of these animatronics is that neither of them walk. It's been a point since FNAF 1 that every animatronic has been able to walk up until Pizzeria Simulator, and all of a sudden now we have two new animatronics that don't walk? And then I remembered something very peculiar that Phone Guy says in FNAF 2. Advanced mobility, they don't let them walk around during the day. Isn't that neat? They even move around during the daytime. Now back when FNAF 2 first came out, this just gave us more information that the animatronics could actually move around when the establishment was open, unlike FNAF 1. But the way that he phrases it implies that sometime before 1987, the animatronics weren't allowed to move around in the daytime. And remember how I said Steel Wool was hinting at this carnival game in Help Wanted 2? Well, they've actually been hinting at it since Help Wanted 1 with the Curse of Dreadbear. Now, while Fallfest is a huge topic to discuss considering it has a vital role in the timeline now, we're not going to be talking about that today. Instead, we're going to be talking about these two animatronics, but look forward to the Fallfest video later. So what makes these two animatronics so special? Well, they're both circus themed, neither of them can walk, and they both have spin-off designs of themselves in the future. I think these two animatronics may be the first designed animatronics in the franchise. So how could I prove that? Well, in Help Wanted 2, we find this poster of Fall Fest taking place in 1970, the earliest date that we know of in the franchise. So if these animatronics were designed for Fall Fest, they could have been designed for this Fall Fest in particular. So I think Henry designs these animatronics all the way back in 1970 for Fall Fest. William then attends that Fall Fest and sees how well the animatronics are doing and decides that he wants to add animatronics like these to his diner and rebrands the diner to Fredbear's Family Diner. William then creates his versions of animatronics, Bonnie and Fredbear. Now while his animatronics are doing really well for the diner, it's not enough for him. He doesn't want them to be lifeless animatronics on stage, he wants them to move around the diner. So William decides to upgrade the animatronics from regular standing animatronics to spring lock suits. 
Spring lock suits are cheaper and easier to make than an actual animatronic that can walk around the diner itself, plus it's just a temporary solution until he can upgrade to an actual animatronic that can do that, so as long as nobody gets hurt in the meantime, what's the big problem? William's plan works extremely well. Everyone loves these new animatronics that can move around the diner and play music while they're eating pizza. Henry, on the other hand, didn't want to cut corners on safety, and because of this, his company almost goes under, but William buys him out and together they become a new entity called Fazbear Entertainment. This buyout works extremely well for William. Because Henry didn't want to cut corners on safety, he almost had an animatronic finish that could walk around the diner. Together, the two of them create Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. Sort of. Henry has a lot more time to work on Freddy's than William does because William also has the diner to work at. This means that William doesn't get as much say as to what happens in Freddy's as Henry does, and because of this, Henry designs Freddy's the way that he wants. Henry goes for quality over quantity, which makes Freddy's really popular, even more popular than Fredbear's, so much so that when it comes time to franchising, they decide to just do Freddy's rather than Fredbear's. This is where we start to see William's resentment towards Henry. Henry used the money that William earned from his diner in order to create Freddy's. Freddy's then became more popular than his diner, and Freddy's was the one chosen to franchise rather than his diner. From this point, I think this is whenever the timeline hits 1983, the same year that the crying child dies, but also the same year that Fall Fest of 83 happens. So if my theory is right, that means that Carney is one of the first animatronics in the series, making him pretty much Freddy's dad. I could just imagine it now, Carney being some sort of exhausted dad just trying to wrangle up all of his bare animatronic kids. For our last theory, I want to talk about something that's been lingering since the end of Ruin. Prototype Freddy. Prototype Freddy is the Freddy we find in the Ruin DLC. He's found in the Phaser Blast area where we last see our Freddy from Security Breach when we go to save Vanny. Finding Prototype Freddy in the exact same location that we left our Freddy from Security Breach made a lot of people think that Freddy just got a redesign, but there's a lot of evidence pointing for the opposite as well. Prototype Freddy has the word prototype stamped on the bottom of his foot, as well as an unopened green gift in his chest cavity. With evidence split down the middle, it was hard to tell if this was a new Freddy or a redesign of Freddy, but with Help Wanted 2's release, it gives us more evidence that could give us the answer we're looking for. You see, Roxy also had a redesign between Security Breach and Ruin, but the community kept repeating the same word due to her redesign, retcon. After Help Wanted 2's release, Rytos made a video that included this topic specifically. Really quick aside, I think we need to take a step back as a community and stop throwing around the word retcon so readily. This is Five Nights at Freddy's. We've never had all the answers. I know I and many others saw Roxy in Ruin and assumed that her design was retconned so that it could be used with a fast wrench. But in actuality, we just didn't have all the answers yet. Now we did get to see Freddy in Help Wanted 2, but we didn't get any mention of the prototype version of him in that game. Scott and Steel will like to use the next games in the series to answer questions that were left behind in the previous ones. The fact that we got an answer to Roxy but not Freddy leads me to believe that we have enough pieces left behind in Security Breach and Rune to answer what happened to Freddy. From what we find out about Roxy's redesign in Help Wanted 2, we can safely say that Freddy's redesign was not a retcon in Ruin. So if it's not a second Freddy, and our Freddy didn't get a redesign, why does this Freddy look different in Ruin? Well, let's look back to Security Breach to see what we can find. We literally start the game off by Freddy crashing on stage, so it's not hard to assume that Fazbear would pull out a prototype to put on stage until Freddy was fixed. We then hear Freddy have a bit of an existential crisis when he goes down into the basement and sees all the other endos and realizes that he's being mass produced. Have I always been a Freddy? Am I Monty with a different shell? W what if I am not the first Glamrock Freddy? Are there more of me at other pizzerias? Do we all feel the same? Am I special? If I am mass produced, am I still art? And finally, I might be just looking too far into a really small detail, 
but if you choose the Vanny ending at any of the exits, your screen fades to black and then you get teleported to Phaser Blast. If you choose the Burn Trap ending, however, you have to actually find the basement and then beat Burn Trap. It just feels weird to me that during the game you find Vanny's hideout in Phaser Blast, but then you choose the Vanny ending and then you get teleported to there, like something happens in between. So what am I saying happens when the screen fades to black? Well, we know that the parts and service machine can easily remove and reattach Freddy's head, and we know that the prototype Freddy is somewhere in the building. I think once the screen fades to black, Freddy and Gregory go back down to parts and services, grab the prototype Freddy body, reattach Freddy's head to that body, and then go after Vanny. But why go through all the effort of saving Freddy's original body? I think it might have to do with his memories. I think that the way that the glam rocks are designed makes it so that their memories are stored in their head, but their backups are stored in their body. Let's take Monty for example. Before he gets destroyed in security breach, he's able to communicate with us and speak complete sentences. But after he gets destroyed, he's only able to make grunting noises. And we're talking about Monty here. We needed Monty's animatronic claws for Freddy, we needed Chica's voice box, so why would Monty be unable to speak after we destroy him? Unless somehow all that damage from Monty falling caused him to lose his memory and become more animalistic. So what I think happens in both animatronic cases is that when they get damaged, they try to revert back to an old save file, but in Freddy's case, he doesn't have a good save file to revert to and completely dies. In Monty's case, he tries to revert to a save file that's corrupted. This is why when Freddy dies in the Disassemble Vanny ending, Gregory gets upset, because when Fazbear tries to bring back Freddy, they'll use a save state that they have from him, and that save state won't remember who Gregory is. So Freddy's plan is pretty simple. Go into the fight with the prototype's body so that his body with his backups aren't in danger. Or hey, maybe I'm just looking way too far into it and he's just sentimental about his old body. And with that, I want to thank everyone for watching my video. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the like button down below. And if you want to see more of my content in the future, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. If you want to see more of my content, here's a theory video of me breaking down all the Afton family members, and here's a playlist of all my theory videos. Thanks again for watching to the very end, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye!